I'm oral historian Mike Chappelle. Today, June 19th, 2010, I'm interviewing Dr. Jean Wilson for the Endocrine Society at its annual meeting being held this year at the San Diego Convention Center. Dr. Wilson, would you tell me a little bit about your family background, starting with your grandparents? Yes, I'm a fifth generation Texan. Um, my father's family immigrated to Texas between the 1840s and the 1860s. My mother's family came after uh, the Civil War, and both families were fundamentally farmers. What kind of education did your parents have? Well, they were members of the first generations in their families who went to college. My father had a bachelor's degree from Baylor University and a master's degree from Texas Tech University. My mother had two years of college, um, the last one at the University of Texas at Austin. And what did your parents do for a living while you were growing up? <clears throat> well, by that time, my mother was a live-at-home mom. My father was in education. He started out working for the Texas State Department of Education and then became successively, uh, su he became superintendent of schools successively at larger and larger school systems in the state, the last one being Hillsboro. What was your experience growing up in Texas during the Great Depression and World War II? <clears throat> well, because my father always had a job, uh, we didn't really suffer from the de Depression directly. And uh, though in small town Texas, everybody was relatively poor and we didn't feel poor. <laughs> Uh, World War II was very interesting. It really didn't change daily life very much except for worrying about gasoline rationing. <laughs> but I early became a war buff and um, had a giant map at home and rushed home every day to listen to broadcast and move pins around <laughs> on maps. And so I followed the war as an intense uh, observer. But uh, I don't think it influenced daily life very much. What type of early education did you have? Well, I would say it was an ordinary education. I was um, <clears throat> start in the best of what small town Texas had to offer. Uh, and I, um, I enjoyed school very much. And I always thought that I was a great student. And it came as something of a shock to me to review my report cards from elementary school and realize that for the first two years, I only got satisfactory marks. <laughs> and it was after that <laughs> that my performance began to improve. And I eventually did very well in school. What were your favorite subjects? <clears throat> I think they were. Um, I liked history, English literature, and biology from the very first. And I liked chemistry, but we weren't, I wasn't taught chemistry as a schoolboy. I learned chemistry from the gift of a very large chemistry set. When I was 10, I managed to do some, lots of experiments without hurting myself or anybody around me. And I really enjoyed it, and I thought it was a wonderful gift. And a, uh, an exciting gift to receive. What about extra extracurricular activities? Well, <clears throat> I was never a sportsman <laughs> much, I, except for swimming and t playing tennis. But I was a voracious reader from as early as I can remember. Um, and I, in th the three years I was in junior high school, I received certificates from the uh, Texas Department of Education for reading 120 books in those three years. And I read a lot of other books, and those were checked out from the library. Um, but I was active in stamp collecting. I played the trombone in the band. Uh, I, as I say, I really enjoyed swimming. When did you first become interested in medicine? Well, I've thought and thought about that, and I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember back that far, I guess. I, um, 
I certainly remember toying with the idea of becoming a college English teacher, which appealed to me. But I also remember from a very early age being very interested in medicine. And I can't tell you how that arose because not only were there no physicians in my family, but I didn't know any really compelling physician role models. And I'm not certain uh, <clears throat> how I did it. In, in high school, I read Aerosmith, a Sinclair Lewis's novel about medical research. And I was inspired, certainly inspired by that. But, um, but I really don't remember how I first became interested in medicine. But by the time you were in high school, after you had read Aerosmith, were you pretty much on that track, would you say? <clears throat> well, yes. I, was, um, I read Aerosmith, and the other book that I read that influenced me in high school was Albert Schweitzer's Out of My Life and Thought. And so I taught, went back and forth between being a medical investigator and a heroic medical missionary. <laughs> Both of the, the, the romanticism of both of which appealed to me immensely. <laughs> Why did you choose to attend Hillsborough Junior College? I didn't uh, choose to attend it. I was forced to attend it by my parents because they felt that <clears throat> I had just, I was 15 years old when I graduated from high school, and I was very green even for 15. In retrospect, I don't think they, they don't make people as green as I was at that age. And they felt that I was too young to be living on my own, and so that, that I would have to attend the local junior college for a year before I went off. And I was very upset about that, but I had a very good year at Hillsborough College and enjoyed it and learned a lot. So I eventually became reconciled to it, I guess. Why did you transfer to the University of Texas at Austin in 1949? Well, um, <clears throat> I assume you mean, why did I choose UT Austin versus some other school yes. to transfer? Well, my mother had gone there, and, uh, <clears throat> and I thought it was a very good school. And uh, I can't remember anything more than that. What was post-World War II college life like as an undergrad? Well. The, the presence of a lot of veterans in the un undergraduate classes uh, had two effects, I think. Number one is they were all serious students and they ruined the curve, so to speak. <laughs> so they, they made it more competitive. And, but in addition to that, they added a sort of seriousness to education that was not typical of the fraternity-oriented undergraduate uh, uh, ambiance at, at that time. And so I think they ad added a great deal to it. And they, the, sa the same thing is true of medical school when I went to it. There were a number of veterans in my medical school class as well. Now, why did you choose the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School rather than somewhere else? <coughs> well, um, the um, the choices for me, for all practical purposes, were two. And that, that is the University of Texas at Galveston, or the Univer or which was the venerable medical school in the state. And the other one was um, the, the new upstart medical school, UT Southwestern. They were both state uh, University of Texas system schools, and which meant that they were, at that time, they were virtually free. The whole the whole fee system was only about $50 a year. And then, so that attending either the University of Texas at Austin or Southwestern Medical School cost <clears throat> my father about $1,000 a year. That's tuition, board, uh, books, clothes, uh, room and board, uh, uh, I don't remember what I said, room and board. And um, so that the two years I spent at UT Austin and the four years in medical school cost my father about $6,000. And <clears throat> his annual salary at that time averaged about $5,500 a year. So they spent 20% of their income on my education each year. And I, uh, 
I was very fortunate, and I realized it at the time that I was very fortunate. But it would have been painful to go to a private medical school at the time, or an out-of-state medical school at the time, because the tuition would have been so much more expensive. While attending medical school, uh, why did you take night school courses at South Southern Methodist? Well, <clears throat> I had enjoyed my undergraduate education in science at UT Austin very much, but I thought medical school curriculum was very tedious and very boring the way it was taught. And we spent an entire year on gross anatomy, <laughs> for example, and I thought it was boring and not well taught and I cons was considering other alternatives. And one of them was to go back and get a, a graduate degree in English. And so I, while diddling around, I took night school courses at SMU. And it wasn't until <clears throat> the start of my third year in medical school that I really fell in love with it and realized I was doing the right thing for me. And uh, I change from being an indifferent medical student to a very enthusiastic one. What happened in that third year? <clears throat> well, I met um, Donald Selden, um, the uh, new chairman of the Department of Medicine there, at the beginning of my junior year. And I found him an exciting, enthusiastic, inspiring teacher and who convinced me that academic medicine was the highest of callings and I immediately accepted him as my role model and uh, that meeting term changed my life. What research did you undertake in his lab during the summer of 1954? <coughs> um, well, it was known that adrenal steroids were involved in um, sodium and potassium metabolism and that people and animals with adrenal insufficiency frequently died of uh, metabolic acidosis. But it was not known why they died of with metabolic acidosis. And <clears throat> Selden had been studying how acid loads were dealt with in the body and had discovered that an, a kidney enzyme called glutaminase becomes amplified when you feed acid loads to experimental animals and it is a result of which the excretion of ammonia in the urine goes way up. And so he thought that perhaps what adrenal steroid, with the absence of adrenal steroids, the, this enzyme would not compensate and that would explain why they had a tendency to develop acidosis. So he asked me to do <clears throat> a study in adrenalectomized rats and find out how they responded to acid loads and what happened to their ammonia excretion. So <clears throat> I uh, uh, used lots of rats <laughs> before I learned proper surgical techniques. I learned the en a good enzyme assay for measuring renal glutaminase methods for assessing blood pH and urine excretion and acid excretion in the urine and uh, <coughs> uh, and the ne necessity for controls and for pair feeding animals to be certain that they were eating the same amounts and the methods these methods were all set up in his laboratory and so I was introduced to a whole <coughs> variety of aspects of experimental design uh, controls and statistical analyses, and uh, I spent uh, actually more than a summer performing these experiments. And the reason I spent such a long time doing it is that I found that in contrast to what had been reported in the literature, that if you took care of the adrenalectomized rats well, they did not develop acidosis. If, and you prevented their from, them from developing volume depletion, by putting salt in the, their drinking water, they survived perfectly well. And he, since that was uh, not what was believed in the literature, I had to repeat it many times. <laughs> um, but at any rate, uh, the results were very clear cut. As long as the adrenalectomized animals were 
uh, taken care of, they responded normally to moderate acid loads and they were able to increase acid excretion uh, in the normal fashion. So this was, ap after repeating this many times, this paper was written up and it was, in a certain sense, it was a negative study because we didn't know why they developed acidosis from this, but we did, we had disproven the leading theory as to why they developed acidosis, or a leading theory as to why they developed acidosis. And with the publication of that first paper in the American Journal of Physiology, that's sort of the, an oceanic feeling of the first paper. It was thrilling and <laughs> I felt I was immortal. <laughs> And it um, solidified my enjoyment of research very much. Now, how did you envision your career going at that point? Well, I envisioned it much the way it turned out. I wanted to do a mixture of clinical medicine, research, and teaching, and uh, follow in my role model's footsteps, and that's about how it's turned out over the years. Have I asked you enough about the impact uh, that Donald Selden had on your career? Well, <clears throat> I would, to what I've said, I would add that um, uh, Dr. Selden, I've never been able to call him Donald, <laughs> that, that Dr. Selden is certainly one of the most critical people I've ever known. If he thinks you're wrong, tells you he thinks you're wrong. Uh, but he is also uh, a very close friend and uh, has been my mentor ever since I ran into him in 1953, I think it was. And, uh, uh, and that continues to today. Did you consider doing an internship anywhere besides Parkland Memorial? <clears throat> well, after you... Um, I read that question in your, in your list. I've been thinking about that. And yes, I did consider it, but the situation for internship selection was so different in those days. The matching system had not been developed, and it was a, you almost had to have an introduction to a hospital to get invited for an interview, and it was, um, it was much more complicated. Um, and con as a consequence, not just me, but many people had a tendency to have their house staff officer training in their home institution. <clears throat> in my case, I thought the Department of Medicine was very good. I had the opportunity to continue doing research as well as clinical training during my residency. And I knew that I was going away from somewhere or further research training at the end of the residency. So it was an easy decision, I would say a convenient decision for me to make, to decide to uh, stay there. Who was your mentor there? Well, Selden continued to be a major mentor, but, the, it just, but he and I were both aware that I did, was not really cut out to be a renal physiologist, which is what his field was. Every time people started talking about the nurse equation, my eyes would glaze over, and I, I realized that I needed a field that was not so mathematically uh, uh, based. And, and I, in addition to that, I'd broken several pieces of equipment in his laboratory <laughs> that were, turned out to be expensive to replace, so he thought I was a little bit of a klutz. And he suggested that I, sh I should work with a new faculty member who had been recruited there, Marvin Sipperstein. <coughs> um, Marvin Sipperstein was an MD from the University of um, Minnesota, where his father was on the faculty. And after medical school, he had gotten a PhD in physiology with I.L. Chaikoff at U University of California, Berkeley. And then he had worked at the NIH and had been a resident in medicine at the MGH. And he had worked extensively on cholesterol and bile acid metabolism and um, had the series of papers he published as a graduate student were quite famous because he was the first person to demonstrate that 
the enzymatic process by which cholesterol is converted to bile acids. And he was um, recruited to set up a laboratory in intermediary metabolism and study metabolic pathways, which was a hot topic at the time. And um, he came to Dallas with grant support and with some local money and he purchased the first liquid scintillation counter in the state of Texas. They were very new at the time and set up a very exciting program and I was able to work with him for a total of six months out of my three years of rest, uh, internship and residency training. And <clears throat> he turned out to be an excellent mentor as well because from him I learned how to use isotopes to trace metabolic sequences in the body. And uh, uh, it, was a, it was a very uh, useful addition to my education because I applied that methodology subsequently at the NIH and then in my own uh, independent research later on. So it was primarily the methodology that you learned with him rather than the particular <coughs> experiments that you did with well, him? Well, the experiments I did were were interesting. I wouldn't say they were just outstanding. There were, I did two different experiments with him. The first had to do with the glucose sparing effect of, of the nitrogen sparing, sparing effect of glucose. James Gamble, in, during World War II, had been studying starvation. It was a burning issue at the time because they were trying to figure out what to put on lifeboats to keep as many people alive as possible in the case of disaster that would keep them alive. And what they discovered was that if you eat, if you're starving, but you can eat at least 50 grams of carbohydrate a day, it enormously decreases the, weight, the rate in which your muscles waste. And it keeps you stronger because your muscles don't atrophy so fast. So the, <coughs> it's called the nitrogen sparing effect of carbohydrate. And the mechanism of that had never been elucidated. And what Marvin and I showed was that the general assumption was that carbohydrate would slow the degradation of muscle. But what we showed was that that was not true, that what the car carbohydrate does is enhance endogenous muscle uh, synthesis the protein synthesis in muscle. And so consequently, the, the mechanism by which carbohydrate, spare, carbohydrate spares nitrogen was different than what had been assumed uh, in the past. And that, paper, that JCI paper is a very nice paper still. Um, uh, and, I, and I'm very proud of it. The other papers were devoted to another issue, a, a clinical issue, and that is how polyunsaturated fats lower serum cholesterol in comparison with saturated fats. And <clears throat> we, um, using techniques that were really a follow-up um, of the ones that Marvin had developed in Chekhov's laboratory, we did a, a series of experiments studying the uh, cholesterol synthesis, cholesterol turnover, cholesterol excretion and cholesterol conversion to bile acids under very controlled circumstances. And what we could show was, <clears throat> what we did show was that um, polyunsaturated fats in lower cholesterol levels in, in experimental animals just as they do in humans, but they do not affect any parameter that we could measure of cholesterol metabolism, neither the synthesis, the turnover, nor the degradation. And so we concluded from that that the most logical explanation for the cholesterol lowering effect was that it caused a redistribution within the body of the cholesterol from the plasma pool to other pools, storage pools. And, um, uh, and we obtained evidence that that was in fact the mechanisms. So I don't think that that's, either of those can be classified as a paradigm shifting study but they were both, in the case of the cholesterol, it was an interesting series of papers. 
in the case of the nitrogen sparing effect of carbohydrate, it was one big paper. But I think they were good paper, at least. Why did you decide to become a clinical associate at the National Heart Institute? Well, <laughs> the alternative was to go into the service. When I finished my residency, the draft the general draft of the people had to have military service, young men had to have two years of military service, had been re repealed. But there was still a doctor's draft that lasted for an, a number of years afterwards. And if you were in medical school or in training, you could get deferred. But at the end of that training period, the deferment was up and you were, you were drafted into one of the services and assigned medical duties. And that could be very interesting or it could be <laughs> uninteresting. And so what I was trying to do was find an appointment that would allow me to continue um, my scientific training and at the same time count for alternative service that would fulfill my uh, legal requirements to the draft. Uh, lest you think that I was the only draft dodger at the NIH, <laughs> it was full of them. <laughs> And it was very competitive in, in large part because there were lots of people like me who uh, were attempting to uh, uh, do the best they could for themselves. And so the positions were very competitive. And I was actually very lucky to get the appointment as clinical associate in the Heart Institute. Whose lab did you work in? <clears throat> I worked with Sidney Udenfriend, a PhD who um, was head of the Laboratory of Clinical Biochemistry at the NIH. He had worked on the malaria project during World War II. He was a graduate of NYU, and he was one of the original people that Shannon recruited to the, heart, to the NIH when the NIH was founded on the Bethesda campus. And he was a biochemist who was primarily interested in amine metabolism, particularly catecholamines metabolism in the adrenal medulla. And he was, I guess, most famous for the fact that when I worked with him, he had just recently worked out the pathway of serotonin synthesis in, the car in carcinoid tumors and the, deg the degradation of um, serotonin to 5-hydroxyindolacetic acid. And that was the first perineoplastic syndrome that was worked out in great detail. And he was, <clears throat> I was the first MD who had ever worked in his laboratory, and he didn't know what to expect with me. But uh, he turned out to be a really wonderful mentor because um, I learned from him <laughs> that you can never do enough controls. You can never do enough controls. He could always think of another control. <laughs> and I've tried to teach my trainees that over the years, that that's half of doing research is getting the controls right. <laughs> and, but at any rate, he um, would stop by in the lab on his way home to find out what the day's results were. And he would think about them at night. And he would stop by in his way to his office the next morning, uh, he was stopped by in the lab again, and he would have thought up an incredible number of controls to do each night. You, would, you, could, you could never tread water to do all the controls he thought of. Some of them were just impractical, and you had to choose the ones that were the easiest to do, <laughs> the most obvious, because some of them would have taken years to ever finish the experiment. <laughs> so, but at any rate, I really, he and I had developed a very good relationship, and he, uh, and remained very close friends. I particularly admired him because he worked in the lab himself, touching glass, as we say, almost every day until just before his death. And, um, uh, and the amazing thing is that he never made mistakes. He never had to retract anything or or worry about that. He was so careful that, and I really admired that, that trait immensely because lots of very good scientists do make mistakes, 
but not Sidney Unifrant. He was, uh, he was really a good role model. What research did you do? <clears throat> well, the, the most important, I, I w worked on more than one problem there, as, as I have almost everywhere, but the most important one I did was a problem that he assigned to me, and he asked me to work with a visiting scientist who was in his laboratory, uh, Kenneth Gibson from London. <clears throat> and he asked us to try to figure out how serine was decarboxylated to ethanolamine. I think I mentioned that he was interested in amines, and ethanolamine is, a, is the structural background for phospholipids. And so it's an, a major uh, intermediate uh, in, inter, uh, in metabolism. And people had demonstrated from, fe from feeding radioactive uh, serine to animals that serine was the immediate precursor of ethanolamine, but they had not been able to characterize what kind of an enzyme did the, this conversion. And he asked me to, to characterize the enzyme. So <clears throat> I designed a series of experiments with Kenneth's help in which we incubated liver slices <clears throat> with radioactive serine and figured out what happened to it, the, the serine. And what we discovered was that before ethanolamine was synthesized, serine was converted to phosphatidylserine, which is, which is a phospholipid. And it looked like that phosphatidylserine was converted to phosphatidylethanolamine without ever going through free ethanolamine, so that the substrate for the re enzymatic reaction was actually a phospholipid rather than a free amino acid, whereas most decarboxylation reactions use free uh, substrates. And with a, a great deal of work, we eventually proved that this was the mechanism by which phosphatidylethanolamine was synthesized. And <clears throat> using such a complex uh, substrate for a decarboxylation reaction was very novel at the time. Nobody had ever heard of a synthetic pathway like this. And the JBC papers that we wrote, the paper that we wrote on this, was a very good one and was, became highly quoted. We went on, in, uh, Kenneth, Ken Gibson and I went on to show then that phosphatidylethanolamine is directly uh, methylated in a stepwise fashion to form choline, which is the major uh, phospholipid. And um, consequently, that as long as there's plenty of methionine in the diet, which is the source of the methyl groups, you don't need to have choline in the diet. It, it was thought that, previously thought that choline was an essential dietary ingredient. We showed that you don't have to have uh, choline in the diet. You can get plenty of endogenous synthesis from phosphatidylserine to uh, phosphatidylethanolamine to choline, and it can be synthesized endogenously. So that all of that was written up in three JBC papers that <clears throat> were very good, and I'm sure that those three papers <laughs> made it much easier for me to get grants, because but they were published just as, as I left the NIH and was writing grants, and I'm absolutely certain that they were uh, uh, very useful to me, in addition to being nice papers. Mm -hmm. How did it make you feel to have that? Oh, kind of? I was very pleased. I was, it, was, it was wonderful. The, um, and I, as I say, I thought I was very fortunate in having him as the mentor and getting to work in his lab. And uh, I was very fortunate that um, uh, I spent my service time doing something that was useful to me and hopefully useful in general and not just uh, uh, dodging. What brought, you, what brought about your return to the University of Texas as an instructor in 1960? <clears throat> well, um, my return had been talked tacitly arranged before I went to the NIH. Selden told me that he wanted me to come back and on the faculty, and that may sound a little bit peculiar, but that was very common in those days. Many other of the junior faculty 
were trainees there who were sent away for postgraduate training and brought back the head of gastroenterology. His successor is the head of renal physiology. One of the young cardiologists had all been done that way. And he had, uh, he was very successful in, <clears throat> in recognizing potential talent and inspiring people to be better than they thought they could be. And um, so it, it sounds peculiar that I was appointed tacitly <laughs> to a job uh, while still a resident, but in fact that was true. And I wasn't the, I wasn't the last one. But uh, at any, so <laughs> that was one reason. And the other reason I decided to go back to Dallas was I didn't get any other offers. And so, uh, so the two together were very compelling reason to go back. Yes. <laughs> what were your duties? Well, um, as a member of the Department of Medicine, I had to <clears throat> attend in a clinic once a week and then run one of the uh, general medicine services at Parkland Hospital for three months a year. And the, <clears throat> the clinic I had to attend in was the so-called metabolic clinic. And um, it had been set up on the model of Dr. Selden's mentor at Yale, uh, John Peters. And it included renal patients, lip dyslipidemic patients, diabetics, general endocrinology. And as someone once said, anybody who had ever vomited, <laughs> but, but at any rate. So it was a very large, uh, diverse clinic. And before, subspecialty clinics were what they are now. Eventually it was split into endocrinology, diabetes, renal, lipid, uh, mineral metabolism clinics. But at that time it was one big clinic. And I attended there all year long. And then uh, the uh, but th the three months running a general medicine service, you only, in those days, you only attended three days a week. And it was all done in about two hours, three days a week. So less than 20% of my time was spent in clinical duties. We had no private patients in those days. We were employees of the, either the city county hospital system or the University of Texas system. And <clears throat> we were, it was considered poor form to compete with the local physicians by seeing private patients. And from the first, we saw a few patients in consultation that, uh, that one physician or the other wanted help with, but that, was the, that was, might be half a day a week, a month. Um, and so it wasn't onerous, and I had plenty of time to set up a laboratory and to um, get things going. And I <clears throat> wrote grant proposals um, and was able to, before I went back, before I got back, I had a, was awarded an established investigatorship of the American Heart Association, which paid my salary for five years. And I got three grants, one from the NIH, one from the American Heart Association, and one from the Texas Heart Association to set up my laboratory. So I really came free to the institution in a, in a certain sense. Uh, and, but it was, it's almost embarrassing how easy it was to get grants and set up an independent laboratory in those days. Um, and how difficult it is now. And I didn't realize what a remarkable window of time I was living in. I assumed that the good days would last forever but uh, it didn't turn out that way. How were you introduced <clears throat> to the subject of androgen resistance? Well, when I um, was given the opportunity to set up my own laboratory, I knew that I wanted to work on hormone action. From the reading I'd done and the work I'd done in Selden's lab originally and the reading, I was convinced nothing was known seriously about how hormones act. They had only been described 50 years beforehand. Endocrinology was only about 50 years old then, but all the focus up to the 
the time I entered it was on either syndromes of hormone excess or hormone deficiency. And <clears throat> I knew I wanted to do something in it. And um, when I was um, a senior medical student, I attended one of Selden's research conferences in which a patient with hypocalcemia was presented. And in the differential diagnosis, he discussed the possibility that the patient might have pseudohypoparathyroidism, which was the first syndrome described in which hormones were made normally, the normal amount, but you couldn't respond to the normal amount because there was something missing in peripheral cells so that there was something missing that the hormone didn't work. It was the first hormone resistance state. And I immediately realized intuitively that hormone resistance states would be a good way to study hormone action. So that, I kept that in my mind for 15 years. When I got out of the NIH, I wanted to write a grant request on hormone action, but I had to figure out what hormone to use and how to go about studying its action. And I did a lot of reading, and I read a very interesting paper by Charles Chokate, uh, Koche, Charles Kochakian, who was then a professor of physiology at the University of Alabama. And when he was a graduate student, he had made the observation in castrated dogs that if you administered testosterone to them, they retained a lot of nitrogen in the, in the form of muscle and, lig and ligaments that increased in the dogs. So, and subsequently, Robert Scow at the NIH had demonstrated that about of the nitrogen that is retained in the uh, androgen-administered castrate male, uh, the va about 25% of it is in the male urogenital tract, and the rest of it is in muscle and, um, and ligaments. So I realized that, I, that somehow androgen was increasing muscle and, and uh, development and protein development in the male urogenital tract. So I thought that because the male urogenital tract, in contrast to muscle, is easy to homogenize, I thought the male urogenital tract was, to go, was the way to go about it. And just as I was going to write the grant request, I read a paper by a man named Christensen at the University of, in the biochemistry department at the University of Michigan, which he proposed a novel mechanism for hormone action, and that is that he, he thought it might increase amino acid transport into cells. So I wrote a grant request to study the effect of testosterone on protein synthesis and RNA synthesis in the male urogenital tract. And um, it was funded in, just as I got out of the NIH. And I had, uh, but so far as I know, it was the first grant ever written on hormone action. And within six months, I had demonstrated that administering testosterone to a castrated male rat causes a doubling of, test of protein synthesis in the seminal vesicles of the of, in the male urogenital tract. It causes a doubling of protein synthesis. And that <clears throat> amino acid transport is enhanced but it's not enhanced until long after protein synthesis is enhanced. So the, what Christensen was de describing was a passive consequence of a depletion of the free amino acid level in tissues so that more entered from the blood. And then I went on to show that a similar thing took place of pro increased protein synthesis in the oviduct of the chicken that was treated with estrogen. So it was, this was not just true for one hormone, but it was true for two hormones. And then, went, then showed in the rat uterus that the um, increase in protein synthesis is due to an increase in RNA synthesis, and that the RNA synthesis is, is what was then called template RNA and is now called messenger RNA. And so within six months, I had made some significant uh, advances in how 
these how the gonadal steroids, both estrogen and androgen, work in the urogenital tract. And <clears throat> um, the the next sequence of events was that we wanted to figure out whether um, the hormone was working inside the nucleus, which is where RNA synthesis takes place, or at the nuclear membrane. And for that, we needed a tissue that was easy to homogenize to isolate nuclei from. And we, I studied the preen gland of the duck. And in that species, we were able to show that the hormone is taken up into the nucleus, and in the nucleus, it's localized in the so-called euchromatin fraction, which is where RNA transcription takes place. Uh, <clears throat> and so the next question, though, is where we, we really had a problem. And that was we, were we needed to identify the molecule, the macromolecule in the nucleus that the hormone was attaching to. And we had a lot of problems with that because every time we tried to solubilize the nucleus so that we could study this, the hormone would come off. And um, we tried a variety of systems. And a student in my laboratory, John Chatfield, and I decided to shift from the preen gland of the duct to the seminal vesicle, back to the seminal vesicle and prostate because we were having trouble with supply of ducts and they were only available a limited number of months each year. And it was difficult to administer the hormone to the uh, rat because if you administer radioactive hormone, it was cleared rapidly by the liver and catabolized. And so um, we worked out a system in which we would do functional hepatectomies in the rat and administer the hormone and then study its metabolism in the prostate. And at that point, the laboratory, fortunately, the laboratory was joined by my first postdoctoral fellow, Nicholas Brukowski, who was an MD, PhD from the University of Toronto. And within a couple of months, using the system that John Chatfield had developed, he um, was able to, um, using a combination of urea and salt extraction of the nucleus, he was able to get a suspension that you could chromatograph on, the, on Cephadex gel filtration, exclu gel exclusion chromatography, and was able to show that about 40% of the hormone in the nucleus was bound to a specific fraction, which he then was able to show was a protein. And up to that time, it could have been, a, it could have been lipid, it could have been RNA or DNA. I did, we didn't know what it was attaching to, but he clearly showed that it was to a protein. But as a control for that, he was aware of the fact that we were, although functional hepatectomies slowed the metabolism, he was worried that what he was studying might be some testosterone metabolite. So as a control, he went back and extracted the, um, radio, the radioactively labeled nuclei fractions that he was chromatographing with uh, chloroform methanol to liberate the steroid and chromatographed it. And what he found was <clears throat> that the majority of steroid that was attached to the nucleus was not testosterone, but rather was the 5-alpha-reduced derivative of testosterone, dihydrotestosterone. And that uh, observation <laughs> changed our approach to everything because, <clears throat> um, first of all, that 5 alpha reduced steroids had been known in the literature for 40 years at least. In the, it was the, the first androgen ever purified from human male urine was androsterone, which is a 5 alpha reduced steroid. And it was known that if you inject it into castrated rats, it's an active steroid. <clears throat> 
<coughs> but when, after it was discovered that it was not the circulate, that androsterone was not the circulating steroid, that testosterone was the testicular and circulating steroid, 5-alpha reduced steroids had gone to the back burner, and they were thought to be degradation products. But the fact that we could demonstrate dihydrotestosterone at the site of action of the hormone um, meant that we had to re-examine all of androgen physiology, we and a lot of other people, had to re-examine androgen physiology to figure out what part of, an of the action of testosterone was due to testosterone itself and what part of action was due to its metabolite dihydrotestosterone. And just as we started those studies, <clears throat> two colleagues of mine in Dallas, Paul McDonald and Finn Sittery, Penty K. Sittery, actually, um, demonstrated that testosterone can also be converted to estradiol in peripheral tissues. So the, the conundrum was that some actions of testosterone were probably due to testosterone itself, some were due to the estrogen metabolites, some were due to the androgen metabolites. And was, so the, the, figuring this out took a lot of studies in a lot of different laboratories. How was this research supported? Well, it was supported with NIH grant funds. And, um, the, um, and it, took, it took a long time. And it took... Um, and not all of it, I, I shouldn't maintain that all of it was done in Dallas, although a large amount of it was done in Dallas. But if at the, at the uh, risk of oversimplifying, I would summarize that 10 years of physiological work on the, uh, by saying that the evidence suggests that 5-alpha reduction amplifies the androgen signal, but that testosterone can substitute um, if it's present in large enough concentration. So <clears throat> it doesn't seem as if dihydrotestosterone is a unique message, it's just an amplified signal. The second thing is that the vast majority of events that occur at male puberty in the human are mediated by dihydrotestosterone and not by testosterone. But there are two events in sexual, in, in male physiology that are mediated by testosterone itself. And that's the promotion of the Wolfian ducts during virilis embryonic development and um, possibly muscle, some degree of, some part of muscle development at the time of puberty. The muscle development is not resolved. It's been very difficult to study because muscle does not contain 5-alpha reductase and there's very little circulating the hydrotestosterone in plasma, but it actually looks as if the hormone bound to the nuclear receptors in muscle is predominantly dihydrotestosterone. So, but the, va the point is that the majority of androgen physiology is mediated by um, dihydrotestosterone. What was your experience of the International Congress of Endocrinology in Mexico City in 1968? <laughs> well, I was, if my memory of it is that I was politely received uh, the, uh, the audience was not large, it was politely received, and I received some congratulations for it, but I would certainly say it did not create a splash. But as people read the papers, it began to make an impression, and I was invited to the Laurentian Hormone Conference and to give lectures and to write reviews, and uh, it was recognized as a paradigm shift in what was previously the, the way androgen physiology had been previously been formulated. You rose through the ranks to become professor of internal medicine at Southwestern in 1968. Yes. How did you divide your <coughs> day and, or week in that period? Well, I... Uh, I still spend about, and I still do about 20% of my time in clinical duties that are different than they were originally. The outpatient service is every other week, and it's a pure endocrinology clinic. It's a much easier 
clinic for me to attend and then the old metabolic clinic. And ward rounds are now one month a year, but they require almost 100% of one's time during that one month a year. So if you average it out over a year, it's still 20% or less of my time. Um, I have a lot of other uh, occupations. I'd, for 15 years or so, I administered our medical scientist training program. As you know, I've done a lot of textbook writing and editing, uh, academic, participated in academic travel and academic politics. And uh, I think that all of these duties probably take up more time than my clinical duties. What was your experience of the social and cultural changes taking place in the 1960s? Well, I was a bystander. Un unlike my cousins who were out <laughs> uh, and when protesting on the streets, I was uh, uh, observing it from the uh, inside. Um, I think that um, the, what I would like to say is I think the most interesting thing to me personally is what effect it's had in medicine. Um, when I joined the faculty at UT Southwestern in 1950, both men and women applicants were actively discriminated against. And that was an accepted system. And it wasn't just true of that school, although it was certainly certainly was true of that school. It wasn't just true of that school. And there were, um, the way blacks were discriminated against was that their um, applications were just never received. They were somehow intercepted and, and never officially received. And women were just uh, discriminated against so that you had to be much, much smarter as a woman than the average male applicant to get in. They were the putative excuse for this was that uh, um, <clears throat> women had a tendency to get married and have children and not practice medicine, and it was a waste of money <laughs> to, to educate them as physicians since they didn't practice. That ignored completely the fact that they just, the system was set up so that you couldn't practice part-time. and. Uh, uh, and it's, the whole concept has been disproven. But at any rate, women now are about half of medical students and physicians. And what they bring to medicine, they're as smart as men, and, but what they bring to medicine uniquely is that they have a much greater sensitivity to human values and social and personal problems of patients than the average male physician. I'm not saying there are not some men who are really sensitive, but women on average are more sensitive, and their sensitivity has rubbed off on men. So I think men are better physicians for training and being around women and being become conscious of the, the humane and personal considerations of medicine, and I think they've really transformed medicine. We haven't done as well with minorities. They're still not 50% of the admission, or they're, they're still not admitted in representation to their numbers, but at any rate, there are enough of them and enough really effective ones that minority issues are much more to the fore and minority problems are now addressed in medicine in a much more systematic way than before. So I think that these two social revolutions have had a very good effect on the quality of medicine in this country and, and of medical education. Would you tell me about your fellowship at the Strange Ways Laboratory in Cambridge with <coughs> Ilse Wisnitsky in 1970? Yes. Um, <clears throat> the University of Texas system does not have a sabbatical system. You, you, some universities, if you work there 10 years, you get a year off for a sabbatical leave. There's no such system within in Texas, or at least at the University of Texas system. But they do have a system, they do have a principle called development leaves, and if you can convince them that you're going to spend the time constructively 
they'll pay your salary for six months to go to a place to learn new techniques or broaden your education and so forth. And I was very fortunate to, that they awarded me a development leave and that the Royal Society of Medicine gave me a traveling investigatorship uh, to pay my expenses in Cambridge and got an appointment at the Strange Ways Lab. And there I did studies that ultimately transformed our work. Um, I knew the, that the evidence had been clear for a long time that androgens um, are responsible for the conversion of the indifferent urogenital tract into the male urogenital tract during embryogenesis. And, the, um, uh, and I wanted to know uh, where the androgen receptors were located, where the 5-alpha reductase was located, and I wanted to f find out whether 5-alpha reductase, of dihydrotestosterone via 5-alpha reductase was involved in the formation of the male urogenital tract. And so I went to Ilsa's laboratory and she taught me how to do embryonic studies. This was moving research to a micro level that I had never done before. And, but like everything else, if you have a skilled teacher, you can learn how to dissect very tiny embryos, get fragments of tissues out, and with appropriate techniques, you can make measurements in them. And so I learned these techniques in her lab. And over the next several years, back in Dallas, my students and I uh, studied the events in sexual differentiation in embryos of a variety of species. And there we made the, the observation that in most, that 5-alpha reductase is active and the androgen receptor is de demonstrable in the male urogenital tract long before sexual, the onset of sexual differentiation so that the, the machinery to convert it to active form and for it to act once it's converted to the active form is there. And the urogenital tubercle, which will become the penis, and the urogenital sinus, which will become the prostate and the male urethra. But in most species, 5-alpha reductase was not present in the wolfian ducts which are converted into the seminal vesicles and epididymis of the male until after sexual differentiation was completed. So <clears throat> we proposed that a, a mutation that impaired 5-alpha reductase activity would result in a phenotype in which 46XY males would not develop a phallus but would develop a male urogenital tract uh, down to the end of the Wolfian ducts. We made that prediction in paper and then 5-alpha reductase deficiency was described in two laboratories in humans. In our laboratory in, in Dallas, we found a family with 5-alpha reductase deficiency and Julianne Imperato McGinley at Cornell studying a large extended pedigree in the Dominican Republic found another one and they fulfilled the prediction and it was, so we had both embryonic experimental data of that uh, to suggest this and proof by a single gene mutation, uh, an autosomal recessive single gene mutation. And it, um, it put dihydrotestosterone on the map in a special way. And we then began to study other forms of other disorders of sexual differentiation, including mutations of the androgen receptor, and people, doctors from all over the world sent us biopsy specimens that, from which we cultured fibroblasts. And w we found that 5-alpha reductase and the androgen receptor are expressed in fibroblasts cultured from the male urogenital tract. And we can freeze those fibroblasts back and then study and characterize the mutant proteins. We did that first functionally. And then when the genes were cloned, we had the world's largest library of uh, frozen uh, fibroblasts from around the world. And five different human disorders were cloned from our library of 
mutations, the androgen receptor, 5-alpha reductase deficiency, 17-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase deficiency, and uh, <coughs> mutations of the LH receptor. I guess that's just four. I guess I'm exaggerating. There's four, mut four different d diseases were uh, cloned from our library. And um, at any rate, so I w all of that started in Ilsa's laboratory in 1970 at the Strange Ways lab. Who were some of your collaborators on that work? First of all, David Russell, who cloned the um, um, five alpha reductase two gene and the 17 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase three gene were absolutely critical in what I did. Um, but Patrick Walsh um, and other urologists who trained in my laboratory, Gunther Jacoby, um, John McConnell, John Gazak, Dirk Wilbert, uh, Uli Winderoff, um, Mark Leshen, Mike McFall, who cloned the, five, the uh, androgen receptor, James Griffin. Um, uh, I can probably edit this, but um, I've so, sort of lost my notes about all the people who worked on that area. But it was, I had a lot of collaborators. And in addition to the collaborators who worked on it in Dallas, um, I had two collaborators um, at, uh, Washington, at Georgetown University who cloned the uh, LH receptor. Louise Lau uh, was, was the leader of the group. And um, I've had collaboration with Bernice Mendonca in, at uh, in the University of Sao Paulo, who has uh, supplied me with enormous amounts of clinical material to characterize the mutations in. How did you discover an alternate pathway for dehydrotestosterone formation? By accident, total accident. <clears throat> The question I set out to investigate was what is the circulating hormone in the male embryo at the time of sexual differentiation? Of, uh, we knew what, what was being synthesized in the testis. You could measure that in a number of uh, species and show that it was testosterone. And we assumed that the circulating hormone was testosterone, as it is in the adult male. But because embryos are so small, and it's almost impossible to get blood from them. Um, nobody had ever been able to measure ho hormones in uh, pool samples of blood from an embryo. And I decided to take advantage of the fact that an Australian marsupial, the Tamar wallaby, has a unique characteristic that uh, <coughs> in which uh, Ninety-five percent or so of females ovulate on the same day. They ovulate on the what, what in uh, Australia is the longest day of the year, which is the 21st of December. And beginning 17 days later, a wave of babies are born. And so if you have enough wallabies and you can collect enough samples, you can study 100 day one babies, 100 day 10 babies. You can pool the, the blood and get enough to actually measure uh, what, what is circulating in the plasma at that time. It's a lot of work, and it's not inexpensive, but it was a practical experiment of nature that allowed us to uh, collect these bloods. And when we did that, we found that there was no testosterone detectable in, in either the male or the female embryo at the in the plasma at the time of sexual differentiation. And so we were left with a, uh, a mystery, is what, what was doing it. And um, I then discovered that um, their t the testes did synthesize testosterone, but they converted it to another metabolite, which I identified as a 5-alpha reduced derivative, androstenediol. Androstenediol is dihydrotestosterone with an additional 
hydroxyl group on it. If the three ketone group has been reduced to a hydroxyl group. And then we could show that that was the hormone that was circulating in the plasma at the time of sexual differentiation. And we showed that in peripheral tissues in this species, it's converted back to dihydrotestosterone. Um, but, and in a series of experiments that took several years, we showed that every phase of male differentiation in that species is mediated not by testosterone as the circulating androgen, but with androstane dial as the circulating androgen. And so this was a new paradigm, and um, we uh, have studied it in a variety of other species and been able to show that um, it's, it's present um, in all species in which we've looked at it. It's, n it's not as striking as it is in the Tamar wallaby, but in, in the, the uh, mouse and in, the, uh, in several other marsupial species, you can detect this alternate pathway. Um, so that was a sort of interesting finding in the wallaby, and the question was, what is that important or not? And we spent quite a bit of trying, trying to figure out whether it's important or not. <laughs> and we haven't solved that, but at this meeting yesterday was presented a paper by Arlt from the University of Birmingham in England demonstrating that the alternate pathway is present in the human embryo adrenal gland. And they think that if that activation of that pathway is what causes virilization of females with 21 hydroxylase deficiency. So what looked like it was just a freak of nature <laughs> in a rare species now turns out to be of potential interest in human physiology as well. And I think it's going to open up, it's clearly going to open up a new level of understanding of how virilization takes place in 21 hydroxylase deficiency. But it was, it was a total accident. I didn't expect that. And I... What led you to suspect dehydrotestosterone excess in prosthetic hyperplasia? <clears throat> well, it had been known for almost 100 years that castration is a pretty good therapy for um, prostatic hyperplasia. And a surgeon named Cabot at the Massachusetts General Hospital in the, I think, 1887 or something like that had published an enormous case series of treating prostatic hyperplasia with castration. It was subsequently shown that um, it, prostatic hyperplasia does not develop in men who are hypogonadal. And so because of those two factors, the, the widespread assumption was that androgen, testicular androgen, somehow was the cause of prostatic hyperplasia. At the same time, it was known that prostatic hyperplasia does not occur in most species. It is very striking in the dog and in the human, but in few other species, if any other species, in most species, there's a limited growth of the prostate, and the, prost the prostate grows to some size, and then growth stops. So th the first thing we did was to look at 5-alpha um, reductase in the prostates of many different species. And what we found was that 5-alpha reductase activity is present in all of them, at similar levels of activity, in embryonic life, but in post-embryonic life, in most species, 5-alpha reductase activity is cut off about the time the prostate starts growing, stops growing. And so, um, and the high activity, persistent high activity, only occurred in species when just the prostate continued to grow. And then we did a lot of studies, and uh, my fellows did, a lot of studies in castrated dogs. These, these studies were never very popular among my fellows because 
it takes somewhere between 18 months and two years to get a result back. But, and fellows don't like that kind of waiting. But at any rate, what they were able to show is that if you castrate a dog, the prostate atrophies, but if you then give um, e either uh, a, a regimen that is able to raise the dihydrotestosterone level in the prostate gland sufficiently, you can re recapitulate uh, the development of prostatic hyperplasia. And clearly, the two things that work were best. The hydrotestosterone is hard to give, and it, was, it turns over, it's, it's degraded so rapidly, but if you give high enough levels of testosterone, you can raise the dihydrotestosterone level in prostate, and it will, that causes prostatic hyperplasia. And then, uh, or androstane diol, which is back converted to dihydrotestosterone, causes prostatic hyperplasia. And so this aroused a, an enormous amount of interest in, uh, among pharmaceutical companies. And a lot of drug companies began to de uh, develop experimental 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, uh, of which the most successful one was the Merck, the, discovery in the Merck laboratories that 5-azosteroids, that is, it's a steroid in which there's a nitrogen substituted for the 5-carbon, um, that those um, uh, molecules have a remarkable affinity for inhibiting 5-alpha reductase, but they do not inhibit the binding of androgen to the androgen receptor. And so, as soon as experimental 5-alpha reductase inhibitors became available, we showed in dogs that uh, if you administer the 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, it causes regression of the normal prostatic hyperplasia. And if you study it in castrated dogs and you administer it along with testosterone, it prevents testosterone-mediated growth of the prostate. Um, and prevents development of prostatic hyperplasia, whereas if you administer testosterone without the 5-alpha um, uh, reductase inhibitor, you can produce prostatic hyperplasia. So for all these reasons, it was a very logical thing to do to try to develop a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. And <clears throat> the first one that Merck developed, uh, an experimental drug, called DMAA was still the best one that anybody's ever come up with, but unfortunately, it had the bad side effect of causing liver damage in some animals, and so it was decided not to develop it further, but they developed finasteride, which is not as potent as DMAA, but is, but is potent, and that drug is the one that went to, to clinical trials first. What role did you play in the clinical trials of finasteride? Well, um, we did the first human study with finasteride, a, a preliminary study, in which the drug was administered to men who were go going to go undergo uh, prostate resections within the next few days, and showed that if we administered the drug before surgery, the hydrotestosterone virtually disappeared from the prostate, so it was working the way it was predicted to work in the human as well as it had in the, the dog. Um, and I was involved in the design of the phase two studies, but when the time came for the phase three studies, they were so time occupying that I got my urology colleagues who had been working part-time in my laboratory, particularly John McConnell and um, Klaus Rohrbahn, to substitute for me and them, and they, they were involved in the phase three studies, the long-term follow-up studies after the phase three studies, and then the trials in prostate cancer, so they were involved in all three of those sets of trials. But I thought that that was um, outside my range of expertise, and I became convinced from the, sitting in on the phase two studies that they're so complicated, the statistical um, uh, issues are so complicated that it would require too large a commitment on my part to do them, and so I would 
remain primarily a laboratory scientist. What were the most compelling issues that you were involved with as president of the Endocrine Society in 1989-90? Well, being president of the Endocrine Society in those days was not the uh, major time commitment than it is now, uh, in the sense that um, we didn't testify before Congress and, <laughs> and lobby on, um, at least I didn't, and I'd never heard of any other president doing it, lobby in Washington. But the, <clears throat> the um, Endocrine Society was undergoing a major expansion. The long-term executive director, Nettie Carpin, had retired and been replaced um, by Scott, um, Hunt. Scott Hunt. Hunt. I'm, I'm sorry. He'd been replaced by Scott Hunt. And um, the issue was whether or not the size of the organization should be expanded. It, had pre as it was originally set up, it was composed of basic scientists and clinical scientists. And the, uh, it had run that way for uh, 50 years, and in practice, the presidents alternated between basic scientists and clinical scientists, and it <clears throat> was done that way because the first two presidents felt very strongly in their presidential addresses that in order, it was critical that basic scientists uh, be involved to help resolve clinical issues and that clinicians were, were important because they could raise the question, clinical scientists, they could raise the questions that the basic scientists could answer. And this had worked so well and uh, that uh, the proposal to increase the size of the organization by opening it to practicing endocrinologists who were not academicians was, uh, would change the development of the, of the society in the future. And so <clears throat> the expanders won out. They were in the majority on the council and in the, the votes of the membership. And it's apparent from the vigor of this meeting this year that that has worked very well. And uh, my fears were exaggerated. But uh, at any rate, uh, the Endocrine Society has certainly flourished in the intervening years since I was president and continues to flourish. What are your current views of the field? <clears throat> well, I'm, uh, I'm optimistic. The, the issue has been raised that basic research in endocrinology is very similar to basic research in cell biology and other disciplines and that uh, the idea of having an organization based upon chemical messengers is, um, uh, will eventually become obsolete. We'll, we'll fade into the realms of other uh, uh, disciplines. But I'm very optimistic about the future of endocrinology for several reasons. And one is that we have all of these orphan receptors and orphan uh, uh, mediators available that they can best be examined using the frame of endocrinology, in, in my opinion. That is very likely that, uh, that they're going to feed questions that endocrinologists can answer for a long time. Second, new endocrine syndromes continue to be resolved, and to, excuse me, continue to be described, and they can, these can only be described by endocrinologists. And the third is that endocrinologists are very well set up to do whole systems physiology. The basis of endocrinology was the feedback loops and the control of the pituitary and so forth. And endocrinologists are trained in that way. And um, I think uh, it's been predicted by many people that endocrinology is perfectly posed to lead a renaissance in whole animal and whole organ physiology. And 
I predicted this 10 years ago, and I thought in the past 10 years that the progress in that regard was relatively slow. But at these meetings yesterday, I heard a paper in which um, the uh, uh, whole, anim uh, 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 whole organ physiology was combined with very clever molecular biology to define a complete new pathway in the brain that, that regulates, uh, that, that can cause obesity, and it can cause it not by regulating food intake, but by regulating the metabolic rate. And if this has the potential of transforming all research on obesity, and it was, the experiments were so beautiful they could only have been um, performed by a molecular biologist who also understood whole animal physiology. And I think that these, this approach for many problems, biological rhythms, um, sexual behavior, many complicated systems that are influenced by more than one hormone, I think that, that these uh, techniques of um, uh, physiology will keep endocrinology alive, certainly through my lifetime and probably through several lifetimes. Thank you.